Today we're going to talk about digital filters. Um, so we did an intro the week before and today we're going to get into a bit more detail. We're going to talk about um, the difference equation and then look at the Z transform. Uh, we'll do some simple examples and then some more detailed analysis of the frequency response of an IIR filter. And then we'll talk about the significance of poles and zeros and what they can tell us about the expected frequency response. So we'll get an intuition um, and we'll actually use that intuition to design a notch filter, so it'll be an ad hoc filter design. Then I'll give you some more information on uh, things like uh, linear phase with FIR filters, and then we'll very superficially go through some uh, standard design methods for filters, which will actually be used in the laboratory um, using the filter design analysis tool in MATLAB. Okay, so let's begin. Um, the definition of a digital filter so, you will recall we have an output, y of n, so n the sample index, y is the output of the filter, and the difference equation is that we have a weighted sum, so we sum from k equal to 0 up to m, and this is a weighted sum of the current input and the previous inputs. So, the weights which we tend to write B traditionally, B of K, so the K weight, um, filter tap or weight, and that gets weighted by the current input, X of N, and its uh, previous values in time. Now that would be, if this was the only term which we had, that would be an FIR filter, uh, finite impulse response filter, and some filters have some feedback where we actually subtract off a fraction of the last uh, few outputs, so weighted sum of the previous output, so we then have a minus, and we have a sum. I'll change the variable to L from 1 to capital L, and that's the weights here are A of L, Y of N minus L. And we can put that in brackets, so that, that term is subtracted off. And this is a feedback term, and that's what makes an infinite impulse response. We can see that if, even if the input was taken away, we would get these decaying uh, weighted sum of previous outputs to make the current output. So this, this impulse, if I give the system a kick with a single impulse at, at n equal to zero, uh, the system will never return to, zero, to a zero value, um, a persistent zero value. And we showed in previous weeks that we could take the Z transform, which is for the ratio of Z transforms of the output signal to the input signal, and that would give what's called the transfer function, which we had been writing uh, with the letter H, so H tilde of Z, and that is equal to, so through some algebra, um, we can write that like this, so sum to M over K, B of K, Z to the minus K, divided by 1 plus the sum over, well, that's, we, we're using the variable L here, so L equal to 1 up to big L, A of L, Z to the minus L. Okay, so that's a quick refresher. We're, we're going to actually calculate some transfer function, so, so derive the transfer function of some example filters, but before we do that, let's do a very simple example. Um, with a simple filter, so example, this is completely arbitrary, but it is used as an illustration. So maybe we have that the output is equal to the input, um, plus 0 0.8. y of n minus 1. And by comparison of this difference equation to the difference equation at the top, we could, um, by inspection, write down the transfer function. So we will have h of z, the transfer function of this filter. is equal to 1 so there's only one B coefficient, that's the coefficient in front of the XN, 
and that's b of 0, and it's equal to 1. And in the denominator, we have the 1 plus, um, well, it's, we can see here, in order to get a minus here, this would have to be a minus, we'd have minus minus. So this coefficient is actually minus 0 0.8. z to the minus 1. And this minus 1 comes because we're taking n, y of n minus 1, the, um, the previous output from the filter. Well, about this transfer function, we've sort of held off until this point, and we're going to get mo into, into more detail about this now, the, the significance of poles and zeros, much more so later on in the lecture. And this has no zeros. So the roots of the polynomial on the, in the numer numerator does not have any zeros. There is no value of z, which will make the numerator zero in this instance. And the denominator, what are called the poles, the roots of that um, will be one pole at z equal to 0 0.8. And if we want to visualize where that is, I mean, it's, it's a trivial diagram in this example, we would have the unit circle, and 0 0.8 is here, thereabouts. So that's z equal to 0 0.8. So this is a real part of z, and this is the imaginary part of z. So we'll return to this transfer function, and we'll actually evaluate its frequency response, which will be its value on the locus of the unit circle in the complex plane by setting z equal to e to the j omega t. And we'll do that later, which is a more rigorous way to analyze the behavior of the filter. But before that, let's just do some um, sort of uh, heuristic inspection. So one thing we might do if we want to understand the behavior of the filter, maybe we'll look at its impulse response. So it's unit impulse response. So what that means is that I give the system an input where it takes a value uh, of 1 when n is equal to 1, so at essentially at time equal to 0. Sorry, n equals 0 to time equal to 0. And we see how the system behaves. Um, in response to that impulse. That is, by definition, the impulse response. So the input will be if n runs across this way, and this is my x of n, which is equal to an impulse, which we would normally write as a, a delta function, like this. We get a value of 1 here, and we get 0 values for all other times. So that's the unit impulse. And what will the system do in this, in this case? So in this case, the output of the system y of n, which is now equal to the input, impulse response, which we oftentimes write h of n, what will it be? And we do this from the difference equation. So the difference equation, remember, is y of n is equal to x of n uh, plus 0 0.8 y of n minus 1. So we can see for n equal to 0, at this time here, the output of the filter will take on the current input value plus 0.8 times the previous input value or output value, which is 0, we assume, for times less than, than 0. So we'll assume that this is the value for all time before when n is equal to 0, when time is equal to 0. So the first value will be 1. Will be one. And as time ticks on, we will see the next value will be, the next input value is 0. So that goes in here for y, y of 1, x of 1 will be 0, multiplied by 0 0.8 by the last output value, which will be x, or sorry, y at n minus 1, which is equal to n equal to 0. Um, so here we get 0 0.8. And so it will go, the next value will be 0 0.8 to the power of 2, and the next value will be 0 0.8 
to the power of 3, and so on, and we will get this exponential decay in the output. It will never return to zero, but, but it will decay towards zero um, with h of n is equal to 0 0.8 to the power of um, minus n. Okay. Next up, let's consider what the output would be if we had a DC input. So we're about to, to turn an input on and hold it at a fixed value. So one way to do that might be to give a step, uh, see what its response is to a step function, a unit um, step function. So that would be a function which, um, let's write step, step response. So the input will be, um, excuse me, zero for all time up until n equals to zero, and then it takes on a value of one. So that is the unit step, u of n. So how will the system respond to a step input like this? This is a way of, of essentially giving a DC input. There's going to be a transient at the beginning because we switch it on. It goes from zero to some DC value, one in this case. Uh, and then we will see um, a DC value eventually settle for the output after a transient response. So the output here, y of n, is equal to, and I can't, well, I can't write equal to h of n in this case. This is not the impulse response. This is a step response. Um, what we will see is the first value uh, will be 1 again. And the next value will be the current input which is now here, we're moving on to n equal to 1, the current input being 1, plus 0.8 times the previous output. So it'll be 0.8 of 1, which is 0.8, so we get 1.8. So the next value, 1.8. And so it will go, the next value after that will be 2.44. And so on. Eventually it will plateau at some value close to 5. So there's an asymptote here which heads towards the value of 5. So this will be, even though there's a transient at the beginning, after some time it will, uh, it will asymptote towards some final value. And I'm, I'm telling you, to trust me, that this value is going to be 5, and I'll prove to you why that's the case um, very soon. The last sort of heuristic inspection um, function that I want to, to put into it will be a sinusoid. Um, and we'll do omega equal to omega s over 2. Now the reason I picked these values, um, the unit impulse is just to see the behavior of the filter. So we can see that it appears to be stable because it is decaying back towards zero after being perturbed in some way. And now I'm curious about the frequency response. So I give it a DC value. So this is step response. It's essentially a DC input. So I'm seeing omega equal to zero. And then I give it a higher frequency, omega equal to omega s over two. That's the, the far end of the spectrum and see how it behaves. And we'll be able to infer, does this look like a low pass, high pass um, function? But, but, but we won't be certain about that. So let's see how this behaves. Um, the input sine wave will be, perhaps we'll stack them on top of each other. Um, this will be x of n. and running this way, and it's at half of the sampling interval, so it will take on values. We'll get two samples per, sorry, half of the sampling frequency, so we'll get two samples per cycle. And let's assume we're so lucky that we can actually hit it at the peak in the trough of every, and the point is there's a, there's a sinusoid on the line here. That's what we're sampling. So maybe we're lucky that we, the phase is just right that we hit on the peak in trough. For illustrative purposes, that's just okay. Um, now, what will the output look like? So y of n. So once again, we'll have a transient. The first value, I should write here, that this is plus 1. And this goes down to minus 1, 1, minus 1, and so on. 
So this is oscillating between plus and minus one sinusoidally. What will the output be? So we'll get um, for the first output is equal to the input plus 0.8 times the value before. And once again, we'll assume our initial conditions that the output signal has no value um, prior to n equal to zero. So these values before n equal to zero are equal to zero themselves. Um, what will we get for the output? So we'll have the current input plus 0.8 times the previous output is equal to the current input. So we start with one. And the next value will be negative uh, 0 0.2 minus 0 0.2. And the next value will be um, the current input, which is 1 minus, or sorry, plus 0.8 times minus 0.2. And we will get 0 0.84. 0 0.84. And so on it will go. Um, eventually, it will asymptote towards a sinusoid, which has goes from 0 0.56 to minus 0 0.56, and the samples will go positive and negative all the way along. So this will be the range from 0.56 to, to minus 0.56. So we're guessing, when we look at the transfer function, at omega equal to omega s over 2, this should be the gain of the system. For an input of amplitude 1, we get an output. After a, after a transient event, the steady state output will be an amplitude of 0.56. So let's do this in a more analytical way and see if that is actually what we get. So frequency response. We've already written this down that h of z, h tilde for z transform of z is equal to 1 over 1 minus 0 0.8 z to the minus 1. And if we want the frequency response, we set z goes to e to the j omega t. And we get h tilde of e to the j omega t, which is the frequency response. Um, equals 1 over 1 minus 0 0.8 e to the minus j omega t. And now we're in a, in a position where we can actually derive these two numbers for the DC response and any other frequency for that matter and the response at omega equal to omega s over 2, half the sampling frequency. So let's do that just to confirm that we were on the right track uh, previously. So the magnitude response Um, so for omega equal to, uh, sorry, omega equal to zero, we will have um, the magnitude of h of e to the j zero t is equal to one on the top divided by the magnitude of the bottom. Well, let's write down what it is on the bottom first. We will have one, um, and we will have minus 0.8 by e to the power of j 0 t. So this will be e to the power of anything which is 0 is 1. So we'll have 1 minus 0 0.8. And the magnitude of that, it's a real number, so really it's, it's trivial. We'll end up with 5. So we'll have 1 divided by 0 0.2, which is 5. And that is what we expected if we, if we flick back um, When we put a step response in, we saw what the step, step uh, response was to a step input, and we got that it was asymptoting towards a value of 5. So for a DC input, or omega equal to 0, the gain of the system was 5. So this is consistent. What about when omega is equal to omega s over 2? Um, and you can, I'll, I'll allow you to do it yourself, but you'll see that that's equivalent to omega t equal to pi. So we'll end up with h of e to the j omega t, so e to the j pi is equal to 1 over 1. Now, if I put pi in here, I get e to the j, and sorry, omega t is equal to pi, e to the j pi, which if you think about the unit circle, um, the angle of pi points with uh, no imaginary term and just a real term in the negative direction. So that's equal to minus 1. 
Uh, so we'll get minus uh, 0 0.8 by minus 1, which is plus 0 0.8, and then this will be equal to 1 over 1 1.8, which is equal to 0 0.56 or thereabouts. So this was the gain of the system at a frequency omega equal to omega s over 2, and we saw that by inspection previously, uh, but, if, but it falls out in a much more simple way by looking at the transfer function. Um, and if we do that for all omega, for all omega, we'll get the transfer function, and this is how we do it uh, computationally. We, we choose many different values of omega, and we evaluate, and we, we plot what the response looks like. We will see that the magnitude response, the so magnitude of h tilde, um, goes something like this. So it will have a value of 5 when omega is equal to 0, and we get to omega s over 2. Omega s over 2, it will take a value of 0 0.56 and something like this. Now, that's the magnitude response. What can we say about the phase response? So, if we do take the transfer function, this time instead of its magnitude, we, we look for the angle of that complex number when evaluated at some value of omega. What do we get? And this is the phase response. So we have h tilde at e to the j omega t. That's the full frequency response. But we just want the angle part of this complex number. What is the value that we get? So it's a bit unwieldy, so I'll just put the angle out in front. Um, the angle of 1 over 1 minus 0 0.8 e to the j omega t. A little bit of manipulation of complex numbers. Um, this is 1 over reciprocal, so I can take this upstairs and I get minus the angle. Um, so I'll end up minus the angle of 1 minus 0 0.8 e to the j omega t. And if I break that out into its sine and cosine components, I'll allow you to do that yourself, you see you get minus the inverse tan of the following. We'll get a plus 0 0.8 sine of omega t divided by 1 minus 0 0.8 the sine of omega t. So it's a little bit of an ugly formula and the point that I want to make here is that this is not a linear function in omega t, not linear. And I will impress upon you later on the importance of linearity uh, in the phase response of filters because it has a nice property in that it has a, a fixed group delay, a constant group delay. Um, so all frequency components get delayed by the same amount when the filter response, the phase response is linear with frequency. But it is not the case for infinite impulse response filters, and it never is. Um, so IIR filters... Um, have nonlinear phase response. If we were to plot against frequency what this angle of h looks like, um, we'll get some function, and it I think it turns at around 53 minus 53 degrees, um, and it comes down like this and turns around and goes back. So, um, and this will be omega t, and this is the value omega t equal to pi. So half the sampling interval. OK. Um, so the next thing I want to do is to talk about the significance of poles and zeros and to try to get you to a point where you can have some intuitive feeling for what kind of filter you're going to have simply by looking at where the roots of the, the, the numerator and the numbers, what are the, the zeros and the poles, where they lie in the Z plane. Um, so let's work our way towards that. We'll go back again and, and rewrite the um, transfer function in terms of the, the, the B and A coefficients. Um, so this is the significance of zeros and poles. So remember, the transfer function H of Z is equal to, we have from k equal to 0 to m, so there are m plus 1 coefficients. These b of k, 
numerator coefficients, z to the minus k, divided by 1 plus the sum, let's go from L equal to, from 1 to big L of A of L, z to the minus L. So that's the second time we've written this down. The reason we're writing it again is I want to expand it and show you how we can get to a factorization and what we can infer from that. So let's expand it. We would have b of 0. And well, b, of, b of 0, when k is equal to 0, we get b of 0, but z to the minus 0. So we get, we get a 1 in here. Uh, and the next one will be b1, z to the minus 1. And so on, dot, 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 all the way up to um, b of m, z to the minus m. And then on the bottom, we have a 1 plus a starts at 1. Uh, z to the minus 1 plus dot 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 up to a of l. doesn't have to be the same. m and l do not have to be the same as z to the minus l. Now we have expanded to get a polynomial in the numerator and a polynomial in the, denom denomin in the denominator. And the roots of this are the, the zeros and poles, respectively. So let's just write it in a different way. I'm going to write a g out here, which is actually a b0, um, but let's not distract ourselves. And we can also write, well, let's do this part last. I want to write it in a way, so factor it so it's written in a way that I have z minus z1, the first root, times z minus z2, all the way up to uh, z minus zm. So because it's an mth order polynomial, we should have m roots. And to write it in this way, we would have to, sub, uh, to extract a z to the minus m out in front. So when we multiply it all together, we'll end up with the first coefficient being b0, which is actually what g is here. And then the same idea on the bottom. So we have z minus p1 for pole, z minus p2, all the way up to z minus p L this time. And again, subtract a z to the minus L. Um, so that the first term that we get, the coefficient is going to be equal to 1. It will be z to the 0. OK. So in, remember, zi are the, the zeros, and pi are the poles. So what can we say from here? Well. It's the magnitude response in particular that I want to focus on, but I'll also talk about phase response briefly. Um, consider the magnitude response now. Uh, maybe we'll go to a new slide. The magnitude here will be magnitude of h of e to the j omega t. We will have equal to the magnitude of g, which should just be a, a constant coefficient, b0, and um, the magnitude of e to the j omega, or minus j omega, mt, divided by e to the minus j omega, lt. And then we have, maybe we should move this. It's going to be a little bit tight. Let's move that over here. Um, OK. Then we will have the magnitude of z. Um, well, I should write this like this. e to the j omega t minus z1. e to the j omega t minus z2. All the way up to the magnitude of e to the j omega t minus zm. Divided by, and similarly on the bottom, e to the j omega t minus p1 e to the j omega t minus p2 dot 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 all the way up to e to the j omega t minus pl the lth root of that equation that polynomial um, and now we're almost there what we can see I'll draw a picture to reinforce this in a moment what we can see is the magnitude of this is well that's whatever it is magnitude of g we don't care about that too much the magnitude of this is equal to 1 so remember, the magnitude of a ratio of complex numbers is the ratio of their magnitudes. And e to the magnitude of e to the j something is equal to 1. It's just a unit circle in the z-plane. 
Um, so what it breaks down to now are the, these magnitudes of the uh, units, distance from unit circle to each of the zeros divided by distance on unit circle to each of the poles. So this is, each of these are, this is distance, distances to the poles, each of these. And this is similarly is a distance to zeros. So let's draw a diagram and that will, will start to illustrate what is happening here. And this is completely made up an example. If I draw the unit circle, um, so this is the locus of z equal to e to the j omega t. Remember, that's how we evaluate the frequency response of a digital filter. We take the z transforms to get the, the transfer function, and we put z equal to e to the j omega t. And we evaluate around the, depending on the value of omega, it puts us at a different place on the unit circle, um, and we can get a, the, work out the frequency response. Now, for some particular value of omega, that will leave us here, for example. Maybe I chose some value of omega that left us here on the unit circle, and I want to know what is the frequency response. Now, perhaps this filter has, we'll switch to blue. Maybe this filter has a zero here, which we'll draw like that. A zero as a circle. And perhaps it has some poles, which I will draw to be um, maybe here and here. To implement a real, it's a bit about polynomials, in order to have a real coefficient in the difference equation, when you factor it out, you have to have complex conjugate, con conjugate um, roots of that polynomial. Otherwise, you won't get real coefficients. So if we want to have a real uh, difference equation, real coefficients in the difference equation, the roots should always, the so poles or zero, should always come in complex conjugate pairs or else there's something not quite right happening. And let's draw these distances in. You know, I'll switch to red. So let's call this one D1. This one will be D2. And this one will be D3. And now what I could write is that the magnitude response of this filter will be proportional by some factor g, so let's say proportional to uh, d1. Well, I should write at omega, right? Um, let's just write the full thing out. h of e to the j omega t, the magnitude response is proportional to D1, which is the distance from the point on the unit circle, which is, is a, um, analogous to the, frequ or the, yeah, the frequency that I'm interested in, distance to the zero, being D1, divided by the distances to the poles, so D2 and D3. So that's divided by, by D2 and D3. D2, D3. And similarly, for if I wanted the phase response, I'll just draw it brief, uh, very quickly here. Um, let's switch to orange. Let's call this one theta 1, the angle this makes with the real axis. Let's call this one theta 2. And let's call this one theta 3. So at this particular frequency, the phase response is going to be equal to the angle of, uh, that, that is made between the unit circle and the zero. The, uh, subtracted from that then the angles made with the unit circle and the poles. So the phase is proportional to, um, well I shouldn't say proportional to, there'll just be a, an offset on that. Um, so some offset plus, will be the angle of G I guess, um, plus theta 1 minus theta 2 minus theta 3. Um, but, but really, it's the, the magnitude response I want to focus on uh, in the next example. So now we have some intuition. I guess let's go back and, and point at that diagram a little bit. What we'll see is that when we're at a frequency which brings us on the unit circle very close to the zero, that we will get 
the magnitude will be small, so the numerator will go to a smaller value in the magnitude response. The gain of the filter will be quite small. And when we're at a frequency which brings us closest to the poles, that distance will be quite small, but being on the bottom as a part of the denominator, that will make the overall gain quite big. So the effect that we have is when we're close to a pole, we get the, amp the magnitude gets, gets increased, um, and when we're close to a zero, the magnitude gets, gets uh, decreased. The visual analogy you can think of is if the Z-plane was a rubber sheet stretched out in front of you, uh, putting a zero at a particular point would be like pinning or pushing the rubber plane down to the ground so it warps down to a zero point. Uh, and where there is a pole that is equivalent to, think about, well, it goes to infinity, but you could put a tent pole under the rubber sheet and push it up, and it will warp that rubber sheet all the way up towards infinity. And as you walk around the unit circle, you will be following the undulations of this rubber sheet, which has been manipulated by poles pushing it upwards um, in altitude, if you want to say, and, and zeros pushing it down. So that's another way, if you, if you like to think more geometrically, to think about the influence of poles and zeros um, on the magnitude response of a filter. Okay, with that in mind, let's continue on and uh, design a notch filter. So completely ad hoc, just using that intuition of the behavior of poles and zeros and, and the distances to poles and zeros and how that affects the magnitude response. Let's design a notch filter. So I'm going to call this ad, ad hoc design. So this is ad hoc, we're, we're flying by the seat of our pants, and we're going to build a notch filter. So a notch filter is a filter which really doesn't affect the signal in any appreciable way, except for at a particular frequency, it totally removes that frequency. And it, it can be very useful for power line interference on biological signals when you record, and you get interference from nearby power lines at 50 hertz or 60 hertz in the United States. You can set a notch filter at that frequency and totally kill that that signal, uh, leaving the rest of the signal, uh, the signal which you're after, um, relatively un unscathed. So, so we want um, the magnitude of H approximately equal to one, and for all, so you say, for all W omega, except um, omega equal to omega C where we want the magnitude of H equal to zero. Well, how would we do this? I guess I'll just give you the answer, um, and then we'll see why it works. So let's try that again. So here's the Z plane, the real part of Z, and the imaginary part of Z. And we have our, let's draw a bit bigger, our unit circle. And let's consider some frequency, uh, omega c, which I'll, I'll totally make up. It's going to be at around 45, omega ct equal to 45 degrees or thereabouts here for this example. Um, but it could be anywhere. So let's say that I want to have some, so whichever frequency this is, This is the angle omega ct equal to pi on 4. And the idea here is that if you know your sampling interval t and you, you're given this frequency, maybe this is 50 hertz if you want to remove or 2 pi times 50, 50 hertz, so 100 pi uh, radians a second, this will give you a certain angle. In this case, for simplicity, I'm setting it equal to pi over 4, but it, it's completely arbitrary. Um, then how will I design this filter? And the trick is that you, well, you definitely want the signal to take a zero value here. And because we want real coefficients, we have to have a zero complex conduit. So as I traverse this unit, this unit circle, uh, maybe I'm at some frequency here. Um, this is my e to the j omega t. When z takes e to j omega t, and I'm at this point, I, I want it to be almost a magnitude of one. Uh, we haven't done that yet, um, but what I'll see is when I get to here, I definitely want this magnitude to be zero at this point, so I put a zero here. 
So we are certainly going to have in our transfer function h of z equal to, there's going to be z minus, let's call that z1, um, z1, and let's call this one z, well, 1 conjugate, uh, z minus z1 conjugate, complex conjugate. Now, there's a problem here because uh, there's no way this is going to give me a, a unity gain elsewhere on the unit circle. It's pretty obvious. Um, so imagine, let's just draw some distances in. If that was d1, sorry, let's change color. Let's go to red. That's the distance d1, and that is the distance d2. We can see that this is going to be proportional to d1 times d2. And there's no reason why that would take a value of 1 as we move away from where those zeros are. And the trick is to try to get something in the denominator which makes the ratio of d1 to, to whatever that, the distance to the pole to be approximately equal to 1 at any other value that's not, where it's not close to the, at the angle we care about. And the way to do that is we'll put, uh, let's switch to blue, I'm going to put a pole right here and another pole, remember this is the same angle in the opposite direction, um, I guess I should be on the angle, um, so we'll put poles nearby at the same angle, but just not quite as far out, so maybe that's at some distance uh, r equal to 0 0.9 from the origin. So now what we have, if I call this one P1, and this of course will be P1 complex conjugate, um, that will complete the transfer function, so Z minus P1, Z minus P1 complex conjugate. And then we've got some distances, let's draw those distances in, in orange. So now I have another distance here, which is D3 the distance from the point on the unit circle I care about to this pole on the bottom. Let's call that D3, so that will go down here. So divided by D3. And then I will have the distance from this pole to, the, again, the point I care about on the unit circle. Let's call that D4. So by D4. And what we can see is when we are far away from the pole zero pair, D1 divided by D3, they're about the same distance, so they both take, the ratio of those two le lengths is approximately one, and the same idea for D2 over D4. So what we get is that these pairs, D1 over D3, D2 over D4, are approximately equal to, so we get approximately one times one, and that's when omega is not equal to omega plus minus omega c. And we get the behavior. So if we look at the, tra if we, if we evaluate for all frequencies up to half the sampling frequency, we will get a response that looks, so here is imagine omega t, and this is pi, and this is pi over 4, in our case, sorry, imagine pi over 4, this 1, and there's the magnitude of the transfer function. Uh, it'll be a little bit above one, actually. Um, you can think about why that is the case. And then it will drop down, and then it will go back up to a little bit above one again. But it takes a value very close to one for every frequency, except for where we put that zero um, to create a notch. So that's quite a cool little trick. Um, OK, some other behaviors about filters that we need to know. Um, properties and behaviors. We, we've already talked in the past about stability, but let's just mention it again. Um, so for finite impulse response filters where there's only B coefficients, stability is not a problem. They're always stable. For infinite impulse response filters where there's feedback in the system, we're taking values from the output and 
putting them back in to make the next output, excuse me, stability can be an issue. And the, the criteria for stability, which we've shown before, is if you plot where the poles are, not, don't worry about the zeros, but where the poles are in the Z plane, they have to be inside. Um, so poles, uh, so magnitude of the poles must be less than one, which means inside the unit circle. Okay, so you can see the notes about that. There's much more information on stability of filters and how to derive um, those criteria. Now, next thing is phase. Um, we're going to move back to FIR filters to talk about this. FIR uh, filters. And they have, they have two nice properties. Two nice properties. One is they're always stable, which I mentioned, always stable. The second is they can have linear phase. Now, what is the importance of linear phase? Let's just talk about that a little bit because I think some, it, it can be a little bit um, abstract sometimes as to why this is important. Consider this is what the phase response that we want to get looks like. So omega runs this way. The angle of the transfer function runs that way. And we tend to want this straight line, which has a relationship that um, the angle, well, yeah, let's just write it again. The angle of the transfer function is equal to minus lambda omega. Let's call that theta. So we want. Oftentimes, we want to have a filter which has a phase response that looks like this, which is completely linear with frequency. And there's a reason why that is useful. And I'll show you by examining two um, specific frequencies. So let's switch to a different color. So imagine if I analyze a frequency omega 1, and maybe I go to a different frequency at twice the value omega 2. So let's consider what that means. We will get a phase theta 1, and here we'll get another phase theta 2. If it's linear, then 1 is equal to twice the other, so 2 theta 1 is equal to theta 2, and so on. Now, let's think about the, the, the periods of those signals. So if I have a signal which has a frequency in radians per second of omega 1, its period is going to be equal to uh, 2 pi divided by omega 1. And its phase shift is going to be equal to minus lambda omega 1. And now with these two pieces of information, we can calculate the actual time delay. So if I were to put a signal through the filter at that frequency, how much in time would it be shifted, delay, phase, phase shifted, so delayed in time um, when it comes out of the filter relative to the input signal? And we need these two pieces of information. This is the phase shift, but this is the actual duration in seconds. So what am I talking about? Well, I'll just draw a little picture down here. Remember. First sign you saw it, this is considered to be 2 pi, so full at 360 degrees, if you want to use degrees. And what this phase shift tells us is what fraction of a period, but it doesn't tell us anything about time, it just tells us at this frequency, which is equivalent to a certain period, what fraction of the period is the signal delayed by. And it's our job to convert that into units of time. So, for example, if the delay was theta 1, then how much time is this? Tau 1, so this is theta 1 in, in radians per second, but, or in, in, in radians, but what is this time interval here? Tau, let's call it tau 1. 
Well, the way to do it is you take theta as a fraction of 2 pi, and you multiply it by the full period of the waveform. So from that, we get that tau on is equal to theta 1 divided by 2 pi. So that gives us a fraction multiplied by T1, which is equal to minus lambda. And if I did the same for omega 2, I would have T2. You can see that it's going to go exactly the same way over omega 2. Theta, I should say 1, and theta 2 is equal to minus lambda omega 2. Then again, uh, tau 2, which is a time delay of a different signal. Um, and we can see that certainly this theta 2 is not the same as theta 1 because the frequency is twice as, as high. So this is actually a larger um, delay. And that's important because we, we, the frequency is higher, which means it's repeating itself quicker in time. So if we want to delay by the same amount of time, we need to cover more degrees of, of 2 pi. Um, so, for example, maybe it's, it's, it's going twice that frequency, so it's going to go up and down every uh, one and a half. But, mm, let's try again. And like this, compared to this one, this is on the, at omega 1 and this one's at omega 2. Now, in order to get the same time delay, it needs to be um, almost this much of the signal. That's tau 2. So we can see over here, this was only, say, the way I've drawn it, this is about a quarter of a cycle at that frequency. But in order to get the same time delay, because this is repeating twice as fast, we need to take almost a half a cycle. That's a full cycle. There's a half a cycle. Um, so the, the phase is different, linearly increasing, but, but overall the time delay is the same. So it's also lambda, seconds, units are seconds. So that's interesting. If we have a linear phase response, then we can get put in a signal, and all of its components go through the filter and all get delayed by the same amount. So it can be quite useful in uh, ECG signal processing, for example, where you don't really want to change the morphology of the waveform, because that might lead to a misinterpretation by a cardiologist, for example. OK. So what we've got from that is FIR, fil FIR filters um, can have a linear phase response, but an IIR, fil IIR filter can never have um, a linear phase response. And something I will say against FIR filters, even though they're, they're stable, they require a lot of taps in order to get the same frequency response behaviors, so sharp cutoff uh, for a low-pass filter, for example, compared to an IIR filter, where you can do a lot more with a lot less computation. Uh, Okay, now just the last thing about linearity, phase, phase linearity, is conditions for that. And we won't prove it here. Conditions for phase linearity. If you want to have a filter, I haven't told you how to do it, if you want to have a filter which has a linear phase response, um, there's a very elegant um, solution, which is simply that, let's try again, draw a straight line, okay, here's my frequency, my impulse response of the filter, it's an FIR filter, and all I have to do is make sure that the, the coefficients are symmetric around some point which gives it a center of symmetry, so normally you'll set center it on zero, but that would make the filter non-causal because you'll have values which are forward in time, for example, but you can shift the filter and there will still be a line where there is a central a center of symmetry. And so what I mean is that you can have uh, coefficients which are symmetric so in this case here here's a center of symmetry center of symmetry. But what's beautiful about it is that you can have different types of symmetry. So you can have odd and even symmetry, and you can have um, um, odd and even numbers of taps. So uh, an interesting example would be that if I had a filter which had taps like this, um, 
And so here's an example of, of the taps of a filter. Um, this will have a linear phase response. And the reason is that there is a center of symmetry, which I've drawn very badly. Um, so center of symmetry. And there is a symmetry, but it's, but it's odd. So rather than being mirror image, it's actually as if you rotated by 180 degrees. Um, but that will still give a linear phase response. So that's great. OK. So we're going to move on to filter design methods. And, and really, um, this is just to give you an introduction to some of the ideas about how to go, how to go about designing filters. We could spend an entire course perhaps talking about this and all the fine details of how to do, do these things. But I just want to give you enough information that perhaps you could go to MATLAB and use the filter design analysis tool um, and understand what some of the, the terms uh, in that tool mean. So, so here we go. Uh, formal design methods. And the first one, which I won't spend much time on, it's, it's not a, a, a great way to do things. Um, oh, sorry, I tell a lie. This is for FIR. So the first one, yeah, is it, pretty, pretty cool. So Windows method. So we have, this is for FIR filters. One type of method, a formal method, where, well, you can go about it analytically, is called the Windows method. Um, so here's the, the procedure. We're not going to go through all the mathematics, which, you, which is interesting, um, but it's going to take us a little bit too long to do that. Um, so what you do is, uh, let's say A, we choose the filter frequency response. OK, so we choose the frequency response we want. B, we perform. The inverse Fourier transform, let's say inverse discrete Fourier transform um, to get impulse response. And see, we sample it. Well, I guess then I should say that's the inverse Fourier transform. Inverse. Fourier transform, and then we sample. Sample to get um, the FIR coefficients. So that makes a lot of sense. We have a frequency response we desire, and then we take it back to the time domain, and we see what the impulse response should look like, and then we sample that impulse response um, to get some coefficients of an FIR filter. So what will that look like? Let, let's just visualize what we're talking about. Um, so omega goes this way. And let's see. Let's make this omega s over 2. So that's the upper and lower frequencies I can really work between. Um, now, I want to cut off maybe. Let's put a 0 in. Maybe I want to cut off here at omega c. And I. There's it's minus omega c. And it's a low pass filter. So I wanted to have a gain of 1 in that range in the pass band and a gain of 0 outside of that. So this is my um, h of j omega magnitude response of it. And if I plotted the phase response on top of that as well, you'd get something that looks like this. So we'd have um, the angle of h is equal to minus lambda omega. Um, the expression that gives these two, so I have a unit response in here and I have a linear phase response. In fact, I don't really care what happens outside of this range. I just want it to be, I care about what happens between omega plus minus omega c. It will be, um, I would have h of j omega equal to e to the minus, well, let's, let's do it in, um, yeah, that's okay. e to the minus j lambda omega. T. 
sorry, let me just fix something. That should be, if we work in uh, Z transform, that would be e to the j omega t. Okay. But it's only valid for omega less than or equal to omega c, omega plus minus omega c. So here's what we would have, and we would take an inverse Fourier transform and get back to the time domain, and then we would sample this. Um, and the, the result that we would get would be in the time domain. Um, I should say t. We're going continuous time. We've done this before, so it's a rectangular function. In one domain, it's going to give us a sink function in the, in the other domain. So we're going to have this sink function. Um, I'll just sketch it roughly. Um, it might look like this, and then it will go like that, and so on. And our job then is to sample it. So we will take some samples from it and try and keep them. If we want linear phase, we try and keep them symmetric, as we just talked about, um, and so on. Probably lost lost one there. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. So ideally, we would take all of the samples from the impulse response, and then we would have a good reconstruction. Um, the issue is that we will probably only end up taking a finite number of them. Um, finite. This will be m the number of taps of the, of the filter. Um, we'll take M of them and then we'll see, as we probably anticipate from some previous lectures, that we'll have um, a spectral smearing effect caused by that finite windowing. Uh, so let's draw some pictures about that behavior. Okay. So here's an example where, now let's move to s sample domains. So we have um, K and H of K, the impulse response to this FIR filter, and these are the samples of a sink, so we've, we've taken it from a, like a brick wall, um, rectangular function in frequency domain, which is a low pass, ideal low pass filter. We take it back to the time domain, and we've got a sink function, and then we sample it, and assume we took all of the samples, what would we get? So I'll just draw the envelope of it. That's the sink. Um, so we have all of these samples. So, all samples. And therefore, in the frequency domain, we have a perfect response. Okay, perfect. So this is my magnitude of H of e to the j omega t, my filter. And that's omega. So this is what we were trying to do. This is the whole idea. Actually, we went this way. We took from um, ideal and frequency domain back to time domain and sample all the samples. But we know that we can't do that. And we're going to end up taking a finite number of samples. And what is the effect that that will have? So in the, in the past, sim same with the discrete time Fourier transform to discrete Fourier transform, we model taking a finite number, number of samples with multiplication by a finite window in time. Uh, so we'll do that again here where we'll have some window. Um, so it takes, this is the function w of k, a window function. And it takes some non-zero values for some samples. Uh, and then it goes zero elsewhere. And we've seen in the past as well that um, so hopefully we've taken, you know, if, we, if we've got enough of these taps, sometimes you might use several hundred um, coefficients if you can um, tolerate it to get the frequency response that you want, um, to get a really good frequency response. So this might be quite wide in time, which means, as always, that we get a very narrow um, scaling in frequency. So hopefully this, what will be a sync function in frequency, is... So this is the transform of W.
So hopefully in frequency, because we've taken quite a lot of samples in time, uh, we get a narrow lobe in, with, with the transform. And now we can model the, what we expect to get for our frequency response of the filter by this only taking a finite number of samples, and that's by convolution. So the result, this is modeling a finite number, finite samples, where now we multiply the two of those together. And, okay. So this is H of K multiplied by W of K to extract out a finite number of samples. Um, so let's say we stopped here. So we would have, what did I have above? I had five up here. One, two, three, four, five. Symmetric, ideally. Um, then I had another two on the bottom. One, two. And one, two. Does that make sense? We have one, one, two, three. Should probably have another one out here, another one out here. So that gives me, let's just count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Good. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Perfect. So everything lines up, top and bottom. Um, and what I can see now is that the result of this is going to be a convolution. We'll get some rippling there at the cutoff, and then we'll get this rippling down here. This is the magnitude of H uh, convolved with W. Now, I haven't drawn it very well, but we get this rippling effect. And we've seen that um, previously in previous lectures. So you get this rippling effect, which is called Gibbs phenomenon. Uh, so all this ripple business is Gibbs phenomenon. And the problem is that actually it doesn't really go away. You would expect that in the limit when we get to an infinity of samples, all the samples, and that we get back to the perfect response. And we, we do if we get to infinity, but we don't get there. Um, well, we never ever get there. So what happens is as we increase it, we push this rippling effect out towards the transition band, um, but its amplitude gets no smaller. And it's not a very desirable um, property. So in practice, rather than use a, a square window, a rectangular window, we would use a tapered window or a bell-shaped window. So the W of K, which is the windowing function we use to extract a finite number of coefficients, um, we use a more tapered shape. So maybe something that looks, it's, it's bell-shaped perhaps, so it looks a bit like this. That's my nine coefficients to match with the previous example. So maybe that's the shape that I use for WK. And the behavior that this will have is its transform. So the magnitude of W of e to the j omega t against frequency. And um, it will be a little bit wider in the main lobe. So this, the sync function on the previous page has about the narrowest main lobe that you can have. It's for, for a rectangular function, we get a very narrow main lobe, but the height of these side lobes can be very large. Um, is when looked at in decibels, it can be strikingly bad. So it's better to use a tapered window. And then what we have is certainly we pay the price. This main lobe is now much wider, so we're not going to get the sharp frequency um, transition band that we want for the filter. But, but at least we get very small ripple out here. So some example of samples of window, you can check the notes, but we see things like Hamming, Han, Blackman. There are different types of bell-shaped windows, and they all do different things. They all either have, they trade off the width of the main lobe for the amount of spectral leakage on the side. So now if we go, let's call this one W2. So we had W2. Now if we did a convolution of H with W2 and the magnitude of that, we will get something which previously, well, let's just overlay it here. Previously we had 
this ripple here and then some ripple here and then ripple down here. So really a sharp transition um, at the cutoff frequency, so this being around omega C here, minus omega C. Um, but we got a lot of this Gibbs phenomenon happening. What we'll get if we use this window instead, so this window in time, here it is in frequency, we'll have a much softer transition. Um, so it will be more like, let's go black. It will be much more like this. So we'll have some ripple and then it will transition up and some ripple, some ripple and then transition down. So we get less ripple, um, but we get a slower transition. from the stop band to the, the pass band. Okay. Now that's one method to design FIR filters, but there are iterative methods that are computer um, based methods which are, are much more accurate and can give you arbitrary responses. Um, if you've got a particular response that you want, you can go down that road. Um, now let's talk about IIR filters. So we don't we haven't too much to go and then we'll we'll stop. Um, all right, IIR filter design. The first method I'll just glance off, it's almost like a first attempt. At a it's not a very elegant method, but it's, it's an obvious place to start at the beginning, uh, which mi mimics the Windows method um, for FIRs. Um, it's called Impulse Invariance. So it's a similar concept to the Windows method, except we're going to do it for an infinite impulse response rather than a, a finite impulse response. Even though, ironically, the impulse response from inverse Fourier transform of a rectangular function of frequency is infinite in its, its domain. So, all right, let's get into it. So what are we going to do? We're going to sample the impulse response. Um, of an analog system. So a continuous time system, uh, we're going to figure out what uh, kind of transfer function we want and then we'll generate its impulse response and then we'll sample it and see and hopefully we'll get a digital filter which gives us the same behavior as that analog filter would have given us. Um, now the problem is it only works, I'm not going to go into too much detail, this is just to draw your attention to this method. Um, the problem here is it only works only for low pass designs. And even then it will not work very well unless you have a high sampling frequency, uh, which is almost intuitive. You want to reproduce the, the impulse response very well, you have to sample at quite a high rate. Um, the issue, the main issue with it um, is imagine there was a prototype analog filter, so some resistors and capacitors, and it happens to have a transfer function which you like the look of. Let's give it subscript A for analog. And we're in continuous time, so we get a transform in J omega. Omega goes this way. So maybe it's a low pass response and it drifts off like this and never quite gets to zero um, as it try and make it symmetric as it tends towards infinity. Now we know about the sampling theorem. If this is the, in the representation of the, the impulse response in the frequency domain um, and we sample it, then we can expect that we're going to get replication of this. In the same way when we sample a signal, we take its spectrum and we replicate it at multiples of the sampling frequency from the sampling theorem. Uh, so if you're going to just sample the impulse response of this system, Sorry, let's try that again. What we expect to see is that certainly you'll get um, this copy here. That's the same as the one above, not drawn very well, but th this is a copy of that. But then we'll get, and imagine that we sample with a frequency 2 pi over t. The next copy will be centered on that, so we'll get. Um, so then it goes all the way out here and then starts to rise up 
and go back down and then we'll get another copy at minus 2 pi over t and that will go all the way out to infinity in that direction and so on and actually there are many other copies and they're all interfering with each other here so we get a lot of aliasing and um, so all of this stuff is aliasing and the point is that you may not get exactly what the frequency response that you want to get. Um, so we need a better way to do this. We can't just sample the impulse response of an analog filter and hope to get what we want. We need some way to force that this response goes to zero when omega t is equal to pi, so half the sampling interval, and then the next copy of it starts, and we've got full control over its behavior in that range. Um, so the way to do it, one way to do that is a very elegant solution. It's called the bilinear transform. Sorry. Let's go to change color to black. Bilinear transform. So let's just rest let me just restate what I what I just said previously that the idea is to take an analog filter that we like the look of um, there's some very uh, clever design techniques and I'll talk about those in the next few minutes for analog filters to give them special properties like a Butterworth is maximally flat and elliptic filter has a very sharp um, transition band and so on so it would be nice to use what we've learned from analog filter design and bring that into the digital world. Um, but the challenge that we face is we have to take a filter which has, uh, which extends over all frequency and map it into a very short range which is from zero to half of our sampling frequency. So how do we do it? That's the challenge. Um, so the motivation again is still to stay with, so we'll pick um, an analog, what's called a prototype. Um, and we'll warp it. Warp from, and its, it's normal domain is on uh, zero to infinity. And we're gonna go um, from omega, well let's call these what they are. So it's, this is omega A in analog, um, just to distinguish them. And we wanna get that from omega dt to be an element of zero up to half the sampling frequency which would mean pi. So this is quite an interesting warping. I want to take the entire positive real numbers, all of the positive real numbers and zero and warp it into um, zero to pi. How will I do it? Well the trick is you take s for an analog filter and you replace it with 1 minus c to the minus 1 over 1 plus c to the minus 1 and it has exactly this behavior. Um, so what do I mean? I mean that you take some filter, so let's do h sub a, a for analog and where it has, is not, it's a function of s and you replace that. Um, so you literally say that your digital filter now is equal to that evaluated at s equal to 1 minus c to the minus 1 over 1 plus c to the minus 1. So that will be h of a at 1 minus c to the minus 1 over 1 plus c to the minus 1. Now the question is how, why does that give the mapping that we want? What we want to see is when, if I put j omega in here um, but now replace it with this which is evaluated e to the j omega t, will I get the right um, relationship between the frequencies? And what I'll see is that it will be, normally you would put in s equal to j omega a in here, and now you would put z equal to e to the j omega d for digital t in here. So what we expect to see is in order to get the same behavior, I should see that this value um, j omega a should be equal to um, this value evaluated at z equal to e to the j omega dt. And it turns out that those two things come together to give me um, omega a 
equal to tan of omega d t over 2. So this is nice because when omega d t goes to pi, I get pi over 2, and tan of pi over 2 is infinity, and that's the mapping that I wanted. Um, so it's a clever little trick. Now, what does it look like? So it all hinges on this relationship, this tan inverse tan relationship between the, the frequencies um, to map from the full range 0 to infinity into 0 to pi. Um, so let's draw a little bit of an intricate diagram to show that behavior. So we would have this is going to show the mapping, omega, the relationship between omega a and omega d t, so digital frequency. The reason I'm writing them differently is because it's, it's, all, it's still frequency, but they don't, they're not the same as each other. So if I write omega and omega, you're going to get confused. This is a different variable to that variable because we're mapping from one variable to another. Um, and this is 2 inverse tan of omega a. So this is meant to go from pi, and this is, goes all the way to infinity. So what I should see is that as omega a heads towards infinity, that it asymptotes towards, towards pi, and that's we get something like this. Now, so that's the mapping, the warping. Um, let's draw below our analog filter prototype and its behavior. So maybe I picked um, a Chebyshev filter, which has some ripple, uh, uh, whichever type, I think it's a uh, type one, which has some ripple in the pass band and no ripple in the stop band. So it will look something like this. Maybe it has a cutoff frequency here, which is omega C, but I'll do subscript A for analog because we're in the analog domain of the prototype. And it's got some ripple that goes between here and here. And let's call this so this will be at zero decibels is how we normally write it, and minus q decibels, whatever that might be, maybe one or two or three decibels down. And we get some uh, ripple, which goes like this. And then when we get close to the cutoff frequency, it dives down. I probably haven't drawn it exactly. It, it dives down. Um, and this will be, let's just move that. And the, yeah, okay, that's enough. Now, if I do the warping, I will see, because really what I'm going to specify is the frequency of the digital filter, the cutoff for the digital filter. So I'll have to do what's called a pre-warping, where I'll take this back to the analog domain, then I'll design the filter, and then I'll put in the substitution. And that's the process that we'll go through. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. Now here's the digital filter. It's flipped on its side, so you'll have to imagine what it looks like. Um, so again, this is uh, omega dt, and again we had some zero decibels, and we had minus Q and if we do the warping now where we bring up the frequency this is my omega C in the digital subscript DT so this is my cutoff frequency um, in the digital realm times t. This is the value you'll start with. This is the cutoff frequency. So this is from where it all begins. And you actually do the warping this way. This is what's called pre-warping. So you go this direction. You pre-warp the frequency. And then you bring, come down this way. You come down. And you figure out what that frequency will be in the analog domain. Then you design the filter. So this will be step one, which is pre-warp. Step two, design 
step three is s becomes one z to the minus one over one plus z to the minus one. And that is the bilinear transform design method. Um, now, the only thing I haven't drawn is I should finish off this. There were one, two, three humps, so let's go. One, two, three, like that. And now let's try again because a very important mistake. It is going to hit zero at this point. Um, sorry, at this point here. So it's going to go one, two, three, and then dive down, and it will actually touch zero at this point. So this is the most interesting thing about it. Even though the analog filter continues forever, this, after it's warping, actually takes the value at infinity and pins it down on um, the omega dt axis at, at pi. So there's no aliasing because the next copy, if you, if you turn your head sideways, the next copy of the spectrum will start off here and go that way. So there's no aliasing. It's a very nice um, little trick. And this can be used. It doesn't have to be used for low pass. You can use it for high pass, band pass, any design. But you've got to pre-warp first. So you've got to figure out the frequencies you want do the pre-warping, design the filter in the analog domain, and then make the substitution. Um, okay. So we'll finish off with some um, special filter types. Special filters. We have, and these are quite famous, we have Butterworth. which is what's said to be maximally flat. So H, and this is analog, in the analog domain. Um, so this is the reason why we might take an analog prototype and map it to the digital domain with bilinear transform, because in the analog domain, they've already been designed to have some very nice properties. So this is maximally flat, which means that it's, if it's an nth order, which relates to the degree of the polynomial in the Laplace transform of the, um, for, the, for the system, then it will be flat at this point um, for the first n derivatives with respect to frequency. So maximally flat. But the price that we pay is we get a slow cutoff. So it's very, very flat. You can have w almost flat gain across the whole thing. And that might be important if you don't want to be slightly amplifying one frequency component above any other. Um, but the price that you're going to pay for having such a flat response is that it's very hard to go from going completely flat for the first 10 derivatives here and then getting down to after the cutoff frequency, omega c, um, which is defined as the point where it gets to minus 3 decibels below that value. If that's 0 decibels. Um, it's very hard to get down. So this transition zone uh, is very, uh, is very, it's extended, and the cutoff uh, rate is quite slow here. Um, quite the opposite is an elliptic filter. An elliptic filter will allow you to have some ripple in the stop band and the pass band and the stop band. Um, so this is zero decibels here. And you can go down to minus Q decibels and then maybe down to minus R. So we can have some ripple. And depending on the order, you get a different number of ripples. Um, you've got some cutoff frequency, omega C. And what we'll get is it can ripple up and down a few times depending on the order of the filter. And then it will dive bomb down to the bottom. And it will actually ripple around on the bottom as well. And this is a better sharp, I believe it's the sharpest filter that you can get for that order. Sharpest cutoff. So in terms of the, the cutoff, the transition from, from pass band to stop band is very, very sharp. So if, you want to be, if you're very specifically, you don't want to change too much in here, but it's definitely got to cut off immediately. 
then elliptic filter is the way. The problem is the price you pay is it's rippling up and down in the passband, so you get slightly different attenuations for different components in the passband. Um, and this ripple in the stop band also, this is called, so it's called ripple. Um, it's the combination of ripple in the passband and the stop band that allows you to do that. If you want to con contain it to ripple in either the pass or stop band, then you end up with a Chebyshev filter, which is something of a compromise. Chebyshev, spelt, I've seen it spelt many different ways. Um, there are two types, of course, depending on whether I allow the ripple to be in the pass or a stop, um, stop band. So type one will uh, ripple up here like this, and then it will dive down, but no ripple down here. This is type one. And type two will be um, quite flat up here, and then we'll dive down and we'll ripple around down here. Okay. So that more or less brings us to the end. I think just to cover a summary to, to, to cover what we talked about, uh, I gave you the difference equation of a, an IIR filter. So you had the, the weighted sum, the, 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 what was essentially an FIR filter with weighted sum of current and previous inputs um, by the B coefficients. And then we would subtract away from that a weighted sum of the previous outputs uh, using the A coefficients. And we saw that um, those coefficients are able, allow us to express the transfer function, the Z transform, which is a transfer function of the, the system. And if we set Z equal to e to the j omega t, then we get the frequency response. So we took this frequency response and we factored it out. And we got a bunch of multiplied terms on the top, on the numerator, um, which were distances from the unit circle to, to the zeros. Um, and on, in the denominator, we had distances from the unit circle to the poles. And it, so it turns out then that the, the magnitude response of a filter, intuitively you can look at it and imagine multiplying the distances from the unit circle at any, which gives you a particular frequency where you are in the unit circle, to all of the zeros, put that on the numerator, and then multiply the distances from the unit circle to all of the poles and put that on the denominator, and that gives you a feeling for what the amplitude response, the magnitude response is going to be of the filter. Another way to visualize is geometrically that the Z plane is some rubber sheet stretched out before you, and looking down you have to walk around the Z, the unit circle on that rubber sheet, and wherever there's a zero, that's pinning the rubber sheet to the ground. And wherever there's a pole, it's like sticking a tent pole underneath the rubber sheet and pushing it off towards infinity. So as you traverse the unit circle, looking directly down, when you come close to a pole, you can imagine the terrain nearby is going to be raised a little bit. So the, amplitude, the magnitude response, the gain of the filter in that region is large. Um, and as you get closer to a zero, or if you touch a zero, it goes all the way down. The gain goes to zero. So that allowed us to design a notch filter where we put a pole and a zero very close to each other such that when we touched the zero on the unit circle, the gain was zero at that point. But as soon as we moved away, looking back at that pole zero pair, the ratio of distances, the, the, the numerator taking on the distance of the zero divided by the distance of the pole and the denominator gave us an approximate, approximate ratio of one. Um, so the gain of the filter is one almost everywhere else, which is a very useful property. Uh, we talked about linear phase response, so um, only FIR filters can have linear phase. Um, IIR filters can never have linear phase. But FIR filters aren't guaranteed to have linear phase. They only have linear phase if there is some sort of symmetry, about a, ce a center of symmetry, which is, can be odd or even, and you can have an even or odd number of coefficients, but there's got to be a symmetry in those coefficients. Um, next, we talked about some design methods. We touched brief briefly on impulse invariance, which means sampling uh, the impulse response of an analog system, which may not be a good idea um, due to aliasing. And a much more clever way um, to, to analytically design a filter is the bilinear transform, which is a beautiful mapping of zero to infinity into the range, zero to pi. But you have to perform a, a pre-warping of the frequency you, you want the cutoff to be at, design the analog filter, and then do the mapping backwards. So that can be done with a pencil and paper and, and, and some help with a calculator. Um, and let's not forget there are many software tools which iter to use iterative methods to try to design, give you the coefficients for an arbitrary filter response if, if it's achievable.